Neil Armstrong, the first man to set foot on the moon, has died. And for Apollo 11, now five minutes, 52 seconds, and we're going. When the American spacecraft Apollo 11 first landed on the moon in 1969, the entire world received the news with excitement. The mission was a significant step in uncovering many secrets about the moon and learning about its peculiar qualities. During the mission, a NASA astronaut made a mind-blowing discovery while orbiting the far side of the moon. The astronaut exposes intriguing facts about the far side of the moon, which is positioned opposite to the Earth. What lies hidden on the far side of the moon that NASA isn't enthusiastic about revealing? What challenges did the far side pose during the Apollo 11 mission? Join us in today's video as we explore Apollo 11. Astronaut reveals spooky secret about the far side of the moon. NASA has undertaken several landmark space missions over the years, but the 1969 moon landing still ranks tops. For many people, this is the most outstanding space achievement in human history. We not only got to enter the moon's orbit but also landed on the lunar surface. This is why the history books will never forget the Apollo 11 mission. More so, whenever the chronicles of this peculiar mission are opened, one name always pops up first, Neil Armstrong, the first man to step on the moon's surface. Armstrong's sojourn to the moon mandated him to undergo a lot of physical and psychological training to ensure the success of the mission. However, he wasn't the only one who had to pass through this rigorous training program. Two other astronauts accompanied him on the mission, Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins. Of the two, Aldrin was the most popular. Perhaps we can't blame people for often overlooking Michael Collins. After all, he wasn't the commander of the mission, unlike Armstrong. Neither did he step on the moon's surface like Armstrong and Aldrin. However, the days of obscurity for Collins are probably over because before he passed away in 2021, he dropped a shocking revelation about the visit to the moon. While orbiting the far side of the moon, the NASA astronaut became privy to an unusual discovery about the Earth's satellite. Thanks to Collins, the scientific community became aware of one distinguishing feature about the far side of the moon that the near-side hemisphere lacks. At this point, it's only fair that the rest of the world learns about this discovery. We can't talk about Collins's revelation of the spooky secret encountered on the moon without going back in time. For centuries, our ancestors have been fascinated by the Earth's only satellite and have spent time studying the moon. As far back as 20 to 30,000 years ago, humans used tally sticks to observe the different phases of the moon and kept time using the waxing and waning of the moon's phases. We even have a 5,000-year-old rock carving dubbed Orthostat 47 that is regarded as one of the ancient depictions of the moon. The ancient Greek and Roman scientists weren't left out as they devoted time to learning more about this mysterious celestial body that was orbiting close to our planet. However, their study was limited due to the level of technology available in that era. Things would take a better turn with the arrival of telescopes. Telescopic exploration changed the game in our observation of the moon, as scientists such as Galileo Galilei could make drawings of the moon based on sightings. Later on, we had telescopic mapping of the moon in the 17th century, thanks to the efforts of Giovanni Battista Riccioli and Francesco Maria Grimaldi. From learning about lunar features to detecting lunar craters, we would uncover a lot of new information about the moon in the 18th and 19th centuries. The most pivotal moment in the human exploration of the moon happened in the 20th century. This was the era when nations seized the advancement in technology to take the study of the moon to a higher level by observing it up close. The end of World War II saw the development of the first set of launch systems, and the Soviet Union and the United States of America undertook it. During this period, no love was lost between the two nations as they were engaged in a cold war, leading to the space race between them. Both nations were focused on outdoing each other in their exploration of the moon. One of the upsides of the competition between the United States and the Soviet Union is that it led to the launch of human-made crafts into space to study the moon. A notable example is the Luna spacecraft, launched in 1959 by the Soviets, which orbited the moon and provided information on its geology and atmospheric conditions. The knowledge gained from these explorations would later come in handy when NASA decided to pursue President John Kennedy's vision of having a human land on the moon before the end of the decade. This vision was revealed during his historic 1961 speech, which drew public interest. NASA was boxed into a corner 
and they had no choice but to deliver. The early parts of the decade saw the space agency develop a series of uncrewed probes that were sent to observe the moon. While this mission was going on, NASA was cooking something big, which they codenamed the Apollo 11 mission. Although the uncrewed probe visits to the moon had revealed a lot of insights about the satellite, there was still much we didn't know about the celestial body. Subsequently, NASA began planning for a crewed moon visit and presented their plans to the government. From day one, it was obvious that the mission would gulp a lot of money, but no one could deny that it would be worth it. Not wanting to be beaten to the goal by the Soviets, the U.S. embarked on the Apollo program at a quick speed. They began preparing the first humans to land on the moon in 1961. Enter Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins. The goal was not only to land these men on the moon, but to return them safely back to Earth. It was a lofty goal, but NASA was up to the task. They began by selecting the best astronauts to work with. It is interesting to note that Collins was the one who designed the Apollo 11 mission emblem. According to Collins, he was inspired to create that concept because he wanted a symbol that depicted a peaceful lunar landing by the United States. Collins' dream began to see the light of day when Apollo 11 was launched on July 16, 1969. Although it was NASA's fifth crewed mission in the Apollo program, it was the most iconic. Over one million people watched the launch live from the surrounding highways and beaches of the launch site. The spacecraft was launched by a Saturn V rocket at the Kennedy Space Center on Merritt Island, Florida. At the time of the launch, the interior of Kennedy Space Center was graced with the presence of the United States Army Chief of Staff, General William Westmoreland, cabinet members, state governors, mayors, members of Congress, ambassadors, and media representatives. The mission's launch was televised live in 33 countries and was watched by an estimated 25 million viewers across the globe. Millions of other people followed the launch by listening to radio broadcasts. So you see that the Apollo 11 launch was a big deal for everyone. The mission, which was under the command of Neil Armstrong, entered into lunar orbit by 5 p.m. on July 19th. The spacecraft is divided into three parts. The first is a command module equipped with a cabin for the three astronauts. The second is a service module that supports the command module with propulsion, electrical power, water, and oxygen. The third section is the lunar module, also called the Eagle. It is divided into two stages. The first is the descent stage for landing on the moon, and the second is the ascent stage designed to place the astronauts back into lunar orbit. After the spacecraft had separated from the Saturn Fu rocket, the astronauts traveled for three days until they arrived in the lunar orbit. As soon as they made it into orbit, they activated the next stage of the mission, which saw Armstrong and Aldrin enter into the Eagle. The duo maneuvered the Eagle till they landed in the Sea of Tranquility, also called the Tranquility Base, on July 20th. Once the lunar lander made contact with the moon, the astronauts swung into action. It was time to behold the moon's beauty physically. Armstrong, being the commander of the mission, had been given the honor of being the first man to step on the moon and he didn't falter when it was time to make this historic step. He was followed closely by Aldrin, and their action was watched live by millions of people across the world. NASA had finally achieved what was deemed impossible, and this effort sealed the United States' superiority in the space race. Over the next two hours, Armstrong and Aldrin would explore the moon, spending their time in the Tranquility Base. They collected as many samples as they could and performed other scientific obligations, by now, you are already wondering where Collins was during this interesting scene. Not to worry, we are getting right to it. Collins was the command module pilot, and this role was pivotal to the success of the mission. As a command module pilot, he received a different form of training. Shocking, right? Sometimes his training was done in the absence of Armstrong and Aldrin. At the NASA Langley Research Center, Hampton, Virginia, he practiced with simulators and undertook measurements for pressure suits since he was the astronaut who would rendezvous with the lunar module. Speaking of rendezvous, Collins took his preparation religiously because he compiled a book of 18 rendezvous schemes for various scenarios. He was ably prepared for a scenario where the lunar module didn't land or the possibility that it launched too early or late. But how did Collins get to this point of piloting the command module for a space mission? Let's explore his background a bit. Michael's father, James Lawton Collins, was a career U.S. Army officer. The senior Collins was a military attaché, which meant that the family moved around a lot. 
Until he turned 17, Collins lived in different cities of the world, and it was during this period that he developed a love for flying. His first plane ride was in Puerto Rico aboard a Grumman Widgeon, where the pilot allowed him to fly the aircraft for a portion of the flight. Contrary to his mother's wish to join the diplomatic service, he joined the United States military, following the path of his father, two uncles, brother, and cousin. Like his father and brother, Collins got admitted into the United States Military Academy at West Point in 1948. He graduated from the institution in 1952 with a Bachelor of Science degree in military science. Having developed a soft spot for aeronautics, he decided to join the United States Air Force and was soon commissioned a fighter pilot after undertaking trainings at different Air Force bases. In the years that followed, Collins would complete assignments at different Air Force bases and was once deployed overseas to West Germany during the 1956 Hungarian Revolution. After returning to the United States in 1957, Collins worked briefly as a test pilot. Although this work experience might seem short, it paved the way for him to be admitted into NASA's space program. Collins had set a new career goal for himself. He wanted to be an astronaut. He had completed over 3,000 hours of flying, 2,700 of which were in a jet aircraft. He made the list of the third group of 14 astronauts NASA chose to train for the Gemini and Apollo programs. From classroom teaching on requisite subjects to physical training, the training program for Group 3 was quite strenuous as the trainees were pushed to their limit. In fact, the training was so rigorous that four of the initial 14 astronauts died in training accidents. All 10 surviving astronauts would end up flying Apollo missions, while five of these trainees flew Gemini missions. Many people often associate Collins with only the Apollo program, but this wasn't the only NASA space mission he embarked on. After receiving basic training from NASA's instructors, Collins was assigned specializations, and he received his first choice, pressure units and extravehicular activities, also known as spacewalks. This specialization meant that Collins' job was to monitor development and liaise between the astronaut office and contractors. He received his first crew assignment in 1965 as the backup pilot for Gemini 7. As fate would have it, he was the first of the 14 to be assigned to a crew mission. By being on the backup crew for Gemini 7, Collins was positioned to be a pilot on Gemini 10. He was assigned to the mission in 1966 with John Young as the commander. Gemini 10 left for space from Launch Complex 19 at Cape Canaveral on July 18, 1966, and the mission lasted for three days. Collins and Young activated their retro rockets on their 43rd orbit, and this action caused them to be dumped in the Atlantic on July 21. The men had splashed down about 3.5 nautical miles from the recovery vessel, which was the amphibious assault ship USS Guadalcanal. They were picked up by a helicopter. The mission was a successful one because they had achieved almost all its primary objectives. More so, the mission made Collins the first person to perform two spacewalks in the same mission. Collins' success with the Gemini 10 mission meant that he made the select list of astronauts drafted into the Apollo program. He was assigned as a backup crew for the second crewed Apollo flight. He was to work with two other astronauts, Borman and Stafford. Borman was appointed commander while Stafford was the command module pilot. Collins was to be the lunar module pilot. As part of the rigorous training for the mission, Collins was made to learn the new Apollo Command and Service Module, CSM, and trained to fly a helicopter. The latter was done to prepare Collins for the landing approach. Regrettably, this mission never saw the light of the day. It was canceled because NASA believed that Apollo 2 would merely be a repeat of Apollo 1. This decision came after the successful completion of the Gemini project. Nevertheless, this was not the end of the road for Collins because he was later assigned to the prime crew of Apollo 9 as the command module pilot. However, he never got to fly in this mission because in 1968, he discovered that his legs were not working as they should. The first occurrence had been while playing handball games, while the second was while he walked down the stairs. Collins' knee almost gave way, and his left leg had unusual sensations when placed in hot or cold water. It took some prompting before he sought medical advice, which was when he learned that he had a cervical disc herniation. This meant that two vertebrae would have to be fused, and this could only be achieved through surgery. The surgery took place at Wilford Hall Hospital at Lackland Air Force Base, Texas. Upon the successful completion of the surgery, the planned recuperation period was three to six months. For three months, Collins had to use a neck brace. 
This unforeseen incident caused Collins to be replaced as command module pilot by Jim Lovell. Although this event might have looked like a setback for the military officer turned astronaut, Collins would later be assigned to a more iconic space mission, one that printed his name clearly on the sands of time. Collins was drafted into the Apollo 11 mission, where he was to be the command module pilot, CMP. After a lot of deliberations, NASA decided that this would be the lunar landing mission. The decade was coming to an end, and the United States was yet to achieve Kennedy's vision of landing a human on the moon. So, it was clear from the onset that a lot of responsibility rested on the shoulders of Collins, Aldrin, and Armstrong. The mission had to succeed at all costs, and thanks to the efforts of the Apollo 11 team, including Collins, this goal was achieved. It would be a fallacy to think that Collins didn't play a significant role in the Apollo 11 mission. Although the world saw only Armstrong and Aldrin land on the moon in the televised broadcast, Collins' presence in the mission made the astronauts return home safely. The command module was dubbed Columbia, while the lunar module was dubbed Eagle. The command module was the only part of the spacecraft designed to return to the Earth. So, when Armstrong and Aldrin entered the lunar module and headed for the Tranquility Base, Collins stayed behind in the command module. After collecting over 21.5 kilograms of lunar material, Armstrong and Aldrin used the Eagle Ascent Stage to leave the moon's surface and rejoin the command module. In the next phase, the men jettisoned the Eagle for the Columbia. After performing several maneuvers, they entered a trajectory that led them back to Earth. At this point, there was increased excitement because of the impending arrival of the astronauts. The Apollo 11 team splashed down in the Pacific Ocean on July 24th. They had spent more than eight days in space and were greeted with a historic welcome. So, you see that Collins is a major character in the story of man's landing on the moon. However, one interesting side to a story that has bothered many for years is what he saw while he was alone in the command module. By being in charge of the command module, he spent his time orbiting around the moon and never reaching the lunar surface. Although this is subject to debate, Collins has been dubbed the loneliest man in history because of the time he spent alone aboard the command module. He spent a total of 21 hours in lunar orbit and spent 48 minutes of each orbit in radio silence. During this period, there was no communication between Collins and his colleagues on the lunar surface or with the mission control center back on Earth due to the radio blocking effects on the far side of the moon. Since the astronaut spent several hours in solitude on the far side of the moon, it's only natural to wonder if he saw anything strange. Ordinarily, one would expect that Collins would have felt anxious or paranoid because he had been cut off from the rest of the world. However, his reaction is far from what one would expect. The astronaut describes the experience as one of serene solitude instead of stark loneliness. Collins is the first person to get a glimpse of the far side of the moon. Also, it was the first time he was in a situation where all forms of communication were cut. It was only when Collins moved back to the near side of the moon that he resumed contact with his colleagues on the lunar surface and the mission control center. Collins' experience has led to a peculiar discovery. The far side of the moon is both radio silent and quiet. This means that part of the moon is free from any radio frequency or communication with humans. Thus, it wouldn't be wrong to say that the moon is a perfect spot for radio astronomy. In essence, Weak signals from the sun can be detected from this location without interference by human activity. This intriguing quality cannot be found on the near side of the moon, which is the part that faces the Earth. The near side is plagued with a lot of radio interference from the moon. This makes it almost impossible for us to get other signals from the sun or other celestial bodies. Also, the far side lacks a substantial ionosphere, which explains why it cannot absorb or retain radio sources. The moon's far side allows us to observe the Earth from a new vantage point and appreciate the planet's beauty. Although there have been a few visits to the far side of the moon, we have yet to fully explore the rugged craters of this hemisphere. However, with the likes of China setting their focus on the far side surface, we are bound to uncover new facts in the coming days. So, let's keep our fingers crossed till then. Thanks for watching this Voyager episode till the end. For another mind-blowing discovery on space, click the next video on the screen.